everybody. Hey, hey, it is fantastic to see y'all. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out of your lives to come together for our annual meeting. My name is Arthur Ritchie. I'm here on behalf of my company, Birkins Ritchie and Associates, and this is your annual uh, employee session for the Drug Free Safety Program. Now, I've got uh, quite a bit of new information for you I'd like to share. I will do a, a, a very brief refresher, hit on a couple of key points, and then I'm going to get into some, some other topics. A couple of them are kind of heavy. I want to let you know ahead of time, we're embroiled right now in a mental health crisis, which involves a suicide epidemic in our country, as well as a, an opioid crisis with uh, quite a few opioid-related opioid overdose deaths. And so I will tread lightly when I touch on those topics. I do understand that those uh, topics have touched many of the lives of maybe some of the folks in this room right now. I'll tread lightly with it, but it's important that I talk about it because uh, in order to increase awareness, I'm going to need to. So uh, with that being said, let's go and get things rolling. Now today, a couple of uh, key points. We're going to go over those program basics that I mentioned. I've been getting a ton of questions about what's going on with cannabis. So I want to give some uh, clarification about some of the uh, cannabis regulations and some speculation regarding some potential changes to those regs. Uh, we'll talk about the, the overdose crisis, not only in Ohio, but throughout the U.S. and in the suicide crisis as well. In Ohio, the, uh, the drug-free workplace program is called the drug-free safety program because that's where the main emphasis is. Our goal here is prevention. We're trying to prevent catastrophic injuries uh, from happening on the job site that are caused by individuals who are under the influence of alcohol or other drugs of abuse. And so bottom line, our most important goal is to make sure that you're getting home in one piece at the end of the day. Beyond the safety component, which is job one, um, there is also a regulatory component to this as well. If your company is not listed in the state of Ohio's database of drug-free contractors, then they're not even eligible to bid on that job. It doesn't matter if you've got the best price or the best workers, the best reputation, they're going to give that work to someone else. And if that happens too often, if those big checks stop coming in, smaller checks stop going out, and that can make a big impact on our lives. It's not something that's top of mind for most people, but it's important to understand that is important. And so the two main reasons are safety and regulatory compliance. Now, in order to maintain that listing in that state's database of drug-free contractors, there's five essential elements. The first is a written policy. That written policy has to have certain protections and certain responsibilities. As far as protections go, there are certain protections for privacy. There are some elements of this program that may result in the provision of medical services, and so those have the same HIPAA protections as any other medical service. And there are due process protections, meaning the policy has to be applied fairly for all workers. So similar situations should be handled in a similar manner with similar outcomes. And that's all spelled out in your policy. If you're not familiar with it, it's important that you review it and so that you don't make a mistake that's going to get you into trouble or worse yet, get you or somebody else hurt. Now, beyond the, uh, those protections, there's also certain obligations, the most basic of which is our obligation to be fit for duty when we're on the job. And fitness for duty involves two essential elements. It requires us to be both sufficiently mentally alert and physically capable of safely performing our duties. So if something's going on with us that is causing significant cognitive or physical impairment to the point where we're not safe to be on the job, then we shouldn't be on the job. Fair enough? Now, beyond the written policy, there's also annual employee education, which we're doing now, annual supervisory education, which we just completed this morning. There's also um, workplace drug testing. There's a number of different times where you're going to be tested for substances. There's also a number of different substances that are going to be tested for. In addition to the training, the policy, the testing, there's also employee assistance program counseling and rehabilitative services. EAP services are a confidential, affordable, accessible services that are made available to employees of employers who have these programs in place. All of us at some point in our lives are going to have some troubles. There's times when situations that we're dealing with are overwhelming. And sometimes they can be so overwhelming that they significantly impact our quality of life or significantly diminish our capacity to safely and effectively perform our duties. And if you're dealing with some situation that you just don't have the capacity to deal with it or you feel like you just need some help, then EAP services are there for you. Um, you can talk to your human resources department and find out the way to access the EAP services within your company. What you say in those rooms stays there. It's like talking to your doctor or talking to your attorney. 
you don't have to worry about it being shared anywhere else. And it's one place that even if you don't have anyone else to talk to, that where you can go and, and lay your cards on the table, sort out the issues. It can be incredibly valuable, it can be incredibly healing, and I hope to goodness if you find yourself in a situation where you need those services that you take advantage of that. Let's get down to business here. With cannabis, um, obviously I'm talking about marijuana. Many of you may have seen that the current administration announced that they were going to pardon any Americans who had prior convictions of having minor amounts of marijuana on public land. So whether that was in, in Washington, D.C., or whether it was in a public park, uh, if they got busted with a nickel bag, or they got in Yosemite National Park and they you know, got busted with a joint you know, by a ranger or something, then the president was willing to use an executive order to pardon all of those individuals. And it really had a very minor impact in the big scheme of things. There's actually only about 6,500 Americans that that applies to. I'm not talking about folks who had big grow operations or folks who were members of a cartel or they were trafficking or anything like that. But if you had a small amount of marijuana and you got in trouble for it a long time ago, that got wiped off your record. And for those folks, I don't want to minimize that action. For them, it's a big deal. But in the big grand scheme of things, it's probably, for most of us, it really won't make any difference. This is a classic story, though, of the headline bearing the lead. And the much bigger story here is that at the same time that that action was taken, the Department of Health and Human Services was also directed to re-examine the classification of marijuana at the federal level. And that has the capacity to impact tens of millions of Americans across the country. All right, let me explain. Attitudes towards marijuana have gotten increasingly lenient. This is a Gallup poll from November of, of 2021 of thousands of registered voters across the country. When they were asked a simple yes or no question, do you favor or oppose uh, legalization of marijuana at the federal level? More than two out of three, 68% said they were in favor of full legalization. Attitudes are one thing, but regulations are another. The reason why the, the re-examination, the classification of marijuana is important is because going back to the Nixon administration, during the Nixon administration, President Nixon included marijuana in Schedule One of the Controlled Substance Act in the category of drugs that are considered to be the most dangerous drugs available to mankind. The way the law breaks down, this Controlled Substance Act created five different schedules of drugs that were mood altering, as well as a category of unscheduled drugs. Now, no matter how potent the drug may be, if it had an FDA-approved use, it was going to fall on schedules two through five. For example, schedule two are drugs that have a high potential for abuse and may lead to severe psychological or physical dependence. This includes drugs like cocaine, PCP, angel dust, fentanyl, Oxycontin, morphine, opium, Dilaudid, methadone, Adderall, Ritalin, Dexedrine, secondols, tuanols, phenobarbital, etc. But these are FDA approved, and so under the right conditions, doctors could potentially, and in some cases frequently, prescribe those for people. Schedule three uh, is for drugs that are less potent than schedule two and have less of a chance of causing physical or psychological dependency. Those are drugs like some of the medication assisted therapies to get off of opioid dependence and some of the anabolic steroids. Schedule four are things that are considered to be even less dangerous than those. Let's consider a lot of the nerve pills, Xanax, Ativan, Clonopin, Valium, some of the sleep aids like Soma, uh, Tramadol, Ambien, some of the anesthetics, Versed, Propofol, and Rohypnol. And then Schedule 5 is the least dangerous um, drugs. Those are like the codeine cough syrup or the Sudafed allergy products. Although some of those can be gotten over the counter, some of them require a doctor's prescription. But if it's anywhere in Schedule 2 through 5, you need a prescription to get it, but you can get it, and it's been approved by the FDA. Now, the unscheduled drugs, some of them require a prescription. Uh, many of them don't. You've got drugs like insulin, antibiotics, EpiPens, asthma inhalers, and some of the overdose reversal drugs, laughing gas like nitric oxide, but also booze and tobacco. All right. And so those are all things that can be purchased legally, either with a prescription or down here, in some cases, without one. Schedule one, in contrast, 
are drugs that have no legally accepted use even under medical supervision, they have a high potential for abuse, and they have no FDA approved medical use in the United States whatsoever. This was reserved for drugs like LSD, MDMA, ecstasy, ayahuasca, you know, DMT, GHB, which is a powerful hypnotic, some of the hallucinogens like psilocybin, peyote, quaaludes, heroin, and President Nixon included marijuana in there as well. He did that for a very deliberate reason. This is not editorializing, that was because the Nixon administration wanted to crack down on their perceived political enemies, on the hippies um, who were opposing the war and on the civil rights activists at the time, um, both of whom were known to use marijuana and, and he wanted to crack down on them to use that as a political weapon. We have launched an all-out offensive against crime, against narcotics, against permissiveness in our country. The rhetoric of get tough and law and order um, was part and parcel of the backlash of the civil rights movement. Nixon administration yeah. official has admitted that the war on drugs is all about throwing black people in jail. He said, quote, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. We've known that to be the case for a long time. It was misclassified. There's no reason for it to be considered to be more dangerous than fentanyl, which is killing people left or right. The Department of Health and Human Services is reviewing that process now. Those reviews generally take at least a year. And what that means for us is that it doesn't matter if you live in a medical marijuana state like Ohio or, and 34 others, or if you live in a recreational marijuana state like, you know, there's 21 of them now or in you know, or Washington, D.C., even if you're legally able to purchase, possess, and consume the medication at the state level, the regulations in the workplace are largely based on federal guidelines. OSHA guidelines, Department of Labor guidelines, Department of Transportation guidelines, Department of Health and Human Service guidelines, et cetera. And because those are federal in nature, and at the federal level, marijuana is not considered to be a medication, then it doesn't matter if you can use it legally at the state level, you still can't have the marijuana metabolites in your system on the job. The urine testing that is the universally accepted standard by the DOT in, in most workplaces tests for an inactive metabolite of marijuana. When the Delta 9 THC, the active ingredient in marijuana, breaks down in our bodies, it breaks down into a chemical compound called the COOH THC metabolite, which absorbs into our fat cells and stays there for a really long time. So when a person uses marijuana, even a, a smoking a single joint, they're likely to test positive for 10 to 14 days afterwards. So somebody who's a semi-regular user can, can test positive for, for two to four weeks. Somebody who's a heavy regular user, we've had clients who tested positive for six, eight weeks, sometimes even longer than that. When workplace drug testing is being conducted, what they're testing for is to see whether or not you are compliant with the regulation. They're testing to see whether or not that metabolite is present. They're not testing necessarily to see if you're impaired. In 2018, when President Trump signed the Farm Bill, it allowed for farmers to start growing hemp, again, without worrying about being arrested. Hemp is in the same botanical family as, as marijuana. The hemp plants actually do contain a little bit of the active ingredient, the same active compound that would get a person high in larger concentrations, the Delta-9 THC. But in order for farmers to be able to legally grow hemp, the plant has to contain less than three-tenths of 1% THC by volume. So by contrast, the standard marijuana plant would contain a third or more of the plant is made up of just the crystals that would get a person high. So like a whole third of the plant, 33% of the plant may be made up of THC. The hemp plants that are legally allowed to be grown under the farm bill has to contain less than one third of 1%. The difference is gargantuan, okay? But chemists figured out a way to extract that little bit of THC from those hemp plants and get high on it. 
And you may have seen those products being sold in stores under the name the Del Delta 8 THC or Delta 10 THC or the TCHOs or these different products that are sold at, at gas stations and smoke shops and vape shops and hemp shops and head shops all across Ohio. Ohio is one of 38 states where those are legal. They can buy them and they're highly concentrated and they can get a person good and high. And for a long time, those were sold with kind of a wink and a nod. Even if you had a job where you were tested, you could use these products and get around the drug testing system. That always seemed very dubious to me. I was skeptical of it. I did not believe that from the beginning. Research has been conducted that proved that THC is THC is THC. It doesn't matter if it's Delta 8 or Delta 9 or Delta 10 or TCHO. When your body breaks it down, it all breaks it down into that same THC metabolite that is detectable by the urine testing. And now manufacturers are required to include that disclaimer on their websites. So even if they're making the Delta 8 or the Delta 10 or these other products, they still have to announce that your body may break it down into the, the metabolite that's detectable. That's like saying that if you, if you have a gasoline soaked rag and you touch a lit match to it, it may combust. You know, it, it's going to. It's not an if, it's a will. If you don't know that and you use these products thinking that you can um, use them safely without testing positive at work, you're sadly mistaken and we're seeing a whole bunch of people who are showing up in our offices who are upset because they bought the hype and ended up getting themselves into trouble. Now, the other question that you get asked very often is what about CBD? And when you're talking about CBDs, you're talking about cannabidol. This is a constituent compound that's present in the marijuana plant. And pure CBD, in its purest form, if it's isolated, will never cause a person to fail a drug screen because that's not tested for. It doesn't cause impairment. It doesn't get you high. Even the scientific community is divided about whether it's truly beneficial or just benign, whether it's helpful or just not harmful. But either way, cannabidol in its purest form is not going to get anybody high or put you in danger. The problem is that many of the oils and products that are being sold as CBD products are really simply hemp oils. These are oils that are being extracted from the hemp plants and they're generally sold in the oil form as either full spectrum or broad spectrum. If you're putting these oils into your body day after day and your liver is breaking them down, even though it's breaking this THC down a little bit at a time, it is still breaking it down into that COOH THC metabolite. And so it's still going to store in your fat cells. It's gonna be a little bit, but it's going to store there. If you're putting a whole bunch into your system multiple times a day, and if you're putting it in faster than your body's able to evacuate it, then it's going to continue to snowball and accumulate until eventually you end up failing a test. It will eventually get to a level that is detectable. And even though CBD actually stands for cannabidol, remember that CBD is can be detected. So bottom line, until things get sorted out, it does not matter how it gets into your system. If it's in your system, it's a violation and we're responsible for whatever we have in our bodies. Between 2020 and 2021, for the first time in U.S. history, we had over 100,000 confirmed overdose deaths, toxicology confirmed overdose deaths in the United States in a 12 month period. That's the highest number it's ever been. And that's largely because our streets are getting flooded with really cheap, potent synthetic opioids. In Ohio, we had a tremendous fentanyl and um, nitazine problem. The numbers are skyrocketing as far as the number of people that are overdosing. According to the Ohio Department of Health last year, 79% of the individuals who had autopsy confirmed overdoses had cocktails of fentanyl in their system at the time of the death. And these were folks not necessarily who were deliberately using heroin or other painkillers. Oftentimes drug dealers are obtaining the street supply with fentanyl in order to get users addicted so that instead of being periodic or episodic users, they become more daily regular customers and they're willing to take the risk that, that some of those customers are going to die you know the profit to them i guess is worth the uh, the loss of those individuals now in addition to fentanyl which is fda approved there's also analogs of fentanyl 
which are not FDA approved, which are flooding our streets in the form of fluorofentanyl, parafluorofentanyl, and the carfentanyl. These are drugs that can be anywhere from 50, 80 to 100 times more potent than fentanyl by volume. And keep in mind that fentanyl itself is already 100 times more potent than morphine by volume. So you're looking at drugs that are five, eight, 10,000 times more potent than morphine. Right? And when you mix those with the experimental drugs, that the nitazine or the isotinazine, those make the drugs even more potent than that. A warning tonight about a troubling trend, a drug that has the attention of law enforcement. Nitazines are potent synthetic opioids. Tom Gurgi is assistant special agent in charge of the Cleveland DEA office. Where it becomes really dangerous is when it's mixed with fentanyl. The DEA is now testing for nitazines in their labs, and so are crime labs across our state. In fact, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation is so concerned about the drug, they issued this bulletin. There has been a spike in the number of cases across Ohio. In the first quarter of 2021, there were 27 nitazine cases. In the first quarter of this year, that number surging to 143 cases. Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost says these Frankenstein opioids are a big cause for concern. These are not drugs that we see used uh, traditionally. Um, they're not like Oxycontin that, are, that, that is a prescription drug. These are um, synthesized in clandestine laboratories on the black market. And they're extraordinarily dangerous. Aaron Reed is with the Ohio Narcotics Intelligence Center. Anytime that you start to see a new drug that you haven't seen before, pop up that way, yes, it is troubling. She says the information they've collected from crime labs across the state mirrors what BCI is seeing, an increase in nitazine cases. This is a dangerous drug, yes. Nitazines were first made in the 1950s for research. The drugs were never approved for medical use. Now sold on the street and mixed with other drugs, it's a potentially deadly mix. There's no such thing as an honest drug dealer. So when you take a drug that is not from a physician and is not from a pharmacist in the normal course, you're taking a risk. It is alarming. Um, I've been doing this job almost 20 years now. It's never been so dangerous. According to the DEA, 290 people die every day of a drug overdose and now fears this could make things even worse. Since COVID came back in, the overdose uh, death rate has spiked again and it's worse than it ever was. Um, so this has the potential to keep driving it. And that's why law enforcement officials want the word out now before it's too late. Our kids can order virtually any illegal drug imaginable with their phones and have it delivered to their homes faster than most of us could have a pizza delivered. And it's easily a big warning for all parents from TV host and relationship therapist Dr. Laura Berman saying her 16 year old son tragically and suddenly passed away after overdosing on drugs he bought off the app Snapchat. Kaylee Hartong joins us with more on this story. Good morning, Kaylee. Hey, good morning, Amy. Sammy was a top student. He had big dreams and he had his sights set on going to NYU. Dr. Berman says she thought her son used Snapchat like kids do to send silly photos back and forth with his friends. She never imagined that he could use the app to find a drug dealer. A teenage boy with too much energy and stuck at home, isolated and bored, thought he'd experiment with something and, and had no idea it would kill him. This morning, Dr. Laura Berman is grappling with the death of her 16-year-old son, Samuel, after an apparent drug overdose. He was playing video games with his friends. You know, he was totally fine. And then an hour later, he was, you know, unconscious on the floor and not breathing. The relationship therapist seen on the Oprah Winfrey Connect Network is still waiting on the toxicology the report, but she believes on. Xanax laced with fentanyl killed her son. Dr. Berman saying her son bought the drugs from a dealer he met on Snapchat. After his death Sunday, she says one of her son's friends shared the dealer's profile with her. This guy also had on his ad with a beautiful, colorful, kid-friendly list of all the things he offered. What was your understanding of how your son was using social media? You know, he would Snapchat his friends. And I had no idea that, you know, there were dealers on there. The Santa Monica police telling ABC News, a preliminary investigation leads us to believe prescription drug use may have been involved but not commenting on the role social media allegedly played. The danger online is pervasive. 
One study finding one in four young people report seeing illicit drugs advertised for sale on social media. In a statement to ABC News, Snapchat saying, we are committed to working together with law enforcement in this case and in all instances where Snapchat is used for illegal purposes. We have zero tolerance for using Snapchat to buy or sell illegal drugs. There are clear signs outside of social media use that can indicate whether or not someone is hopeless or helpless or is experiencing an increase in a desire to use substances. And it looks a lot like isolation and it looks a lot like anger and anxiety and withdrawing uh, behaviors, doing worse in school. Looking back, were there any warning signs that you feel like you missed? No. I mean, this was a kid that was like almost a straight A student. What does justice look like for you now? Justice is just saving one more life. And the more we can, the better. Even if it just wakes one child up to not take this risk and to understand what's at stake. Snapchat says they're constantly improving the app's technological capabilities to detect drug-related activity so that they can intervene proactively. And they say if you witness illegal behavior on Snapchat, use the app's tools to report it. Amy? Yeah, this is a huge wake-up call for so many parents out there. How many of you were aware that that's possible? And it's as easy, apparently, as turning on the GPS locator on their phones, and then they go to these different you know, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp, Signal, there's a, a quite a few of them. The ones that are specifically designed for, for secrecy and, and encryption, they also use Twitter and Facebook, but they'll put those on and send it out and virtually instantaneously the drug dealers in their area will respond and then try to vet them to determine whether or not they are law enforcement or whether or not they're people who are actually interested in buying the drugs. And if they determine that they are a legit customer, they'll give them their handle to jump to a different platform. And from jumping from platform to platform, they'll be able to complete the different stages of the transaction until they eventually arrive on a negotiate a price, a quantity, a, you know, in a meeting place, and then they deliver it to their place and they'll deliver it anonymously. And this is going on all over the country. The anonymity of it adds even more danger because not only are these drugs that are being delivered, but many of them are drugs that are tainted with drugs that the person has no idea about. You know, a lot of the, the stimulants include fentanyl or f fentanyl analogs. There are pills that are pressed to look like one thing out of, out of these pastes that include these very powerful synthetic opioids. We just had two students from Ohio State University who died this semester from overdoses who thought that they were getting some Adderall from social media to cram for an exam and ended up getting fentanyl pills and it killed them. And, you, and if, you, if you look it up, you can find story after story after story about this going on. This is an existential threat to our kids and the technology has so far surpassed our capacity to surveil it that most of us are completely powerless with this. So I want to make you aware of a resource that I found to be incredibly valuable. It's a website called smartsocial.com. Smartsocial.com. This was a, was a website that was designed by kids, by teenagers who had been using this methodology to both buy and sell drugs. They walked their teachers and their counselors at school through it, and they came up with a website to be able to put together a tutorial for parents. And so if you go to that website, smartsocial.com, and look for the tutorial for parents for the social media drug sales, we can at least get a toehold on how to monitor our kids' devices. If you've got kids that you're responsible for, whether they're your, your kids, your grandkids, your nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, whatever, I'd recommend you check it out. Because our streets are being flooded with these cheap synthetic opioids and so many of these transactions are being done anonymously and, and drugs are being tainted with all this other stuff, and I wanted to make you aware of the availability of one of the most effective tools we have in our arsenal. Once an opioid overdose has occurred, one of the most effective interventions that we have available to us is the availability of the overdose reversal medication Narcan or Naloxone. This has become part of mainstream 
public health. It's a recognition this is so common. It's more common that a person between the ages of 14 and 55 will die from an overdose than from a car crash. And so if you've got folks in your home that are in that age group that I'm talking about that may be engaging in some experimentation or someone who you know is a regular opioid user who may run out of their medication and try and occasionally refill their prescription on the streets or whatever, I implore you to please have naloxone on hand, have Narcan on hand just in case. There's a program in Ohio called Project Dawn, like the sun coming up in the morning, D-A-W-N. You, if you want an anagram to remember it, it's death avoided with Narcan or death avoided with naloxone. This organization has a presence in all 88 counties in Ohio and all you have to do is contact them and you can pick up Narcan at no cost. All they ask of you is to watch a three minute training video on how to recognize the indicators of an opioid overdose, how to administer Narcan and how to respond appropriately afterwards. Hello and welcome to the Ohio Harm Reduction Narcan training video. In this video, we will discuss how to identify an opioid overdose, how to get a response from someone who is overdosed, how to administer naloxone nasally, and the steps that should be taken after administration. An overdose can occur anywhere, in a car, a bathroom, at home, or at work. Signs of an opioid overdose. breathing someone call 911 signs include respiratory failure slow breathing small pupils snoring gurgling choking skin lips and nails either blue gray or ashy or unresponsive or limp opioids include heroin methadone oxycontin vicodin percocet codeine and fentanyl it's important you call for help as soon as possible. Annie, 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 Annie. Stimulate to elicit a response. Rub your knuckles on their sternum, shake them or shout their name. Annie, Annie. Administer naloxone. Place and hold the tip of the nozzle in either nostril until your fingers touch the bottom of their nose. Press the plunger firmly to release the dose into their nose. Annie? Annie? Watch for recovery or reaction. Annie? 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 If you need to leave them for even a moment, put them into the rescue position. If they are not breathing, administer rescue breathing. Wait two to three minutes to administer the second dose. If you've gotten no reaction, administer the second dose. Annie, Annie. Annie, Annie, hey Annie, welcome back. Welcome back. Hi, my name is Barbara and I, uh, you have overdosed. Once they regain consciousness, explain to them what has happened. They have overdosed and help is on the way. Encourage them to go to the hospital. It's important you suggest to the person not to use opioids, alcohol, or other drugs within a few hours of experiencing an opioid overdose. Because naloxone wears off after 30 to 90 minutes, using more drugs will increase the likelihood of a second overdose, and using more will not reduce their withdrawal symptoms. I've given you naloxone. The paramedics are on their way. You're okay, I'm gonna stay with you till they get here, okay? All right. Congratulations, you saved a life. Visit the site to share your story and order a refill. Thank you. Folks, 
This is just like having a fire extinguisher in your home or a smoke alarm or an AED in a public building. It's something that you hope you never have to use, but it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And when you find your loved one not breathing because they've been poisoned by an opioid, it's too late to wish you had it then. The person you're most likely to save with this is gonna be somebody that you know and love. Either someone you live with or someone you work with. Those are the people we spend the most time with. I would hope to goodness if it was you or someone that you love who needed that medication, somebody would be there to help them. I hope you can be that person for somebody too. The last thing I need to talk to you about is the mental health crisis in the United States. Coming out of the pandemic, we're having a ton of folks who are dealing with um, depression, anxiety, stress, hopelessness. It's leading to an epidemic of suicide as well. For Americans between the ages of 14 and 55, suicide is one of the leading causes of death. I'd like you to watch this and then we'll, we'll discuss. Hi, I'm Nick Offerman. Thanks for joining me and the good folks at the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Most of us would take action if we knew someone close to us was thinking about suicide. But many of us don't know what to do. Here are five steps to take to be the one to help save a life. Warning signs of a suicidal crisis include extreme changes in mood, sleeping habits, and increased drug or alcohol use. Someone might talk about feeling hopeless or like a burden to others. If you notice these signs, ask directly, are you thinking about suicide? Studies show that asking about suicide does not increase suicidal thoughts or actions. Being there means helping a person in crisis feel less alone, be present and calm, try not to judge, listen to their reasons for being in pain, and help them focus on reasons for living. If you can't be there in person, connect by phone, text, or video. Keeping someone safe means putting time and distance between them and any means they could use to hurt themselves. Work with them to remove dangerous objects or offer to hold on to them until the crisis has passed. Ask, do you have a plan to harm yourself? What's the timing? How would you do this? When lethal means are made less available, suicide rates by that method decline. Help someone with thoughts of suicide connect with others and support resources. Develop a safety plan together with ways to recognize when they are in a crisis, actions they can take if they feel desperate or overwhelmed, and individuals and services to contact when a crisis occurs. After taking these four steps, visit, call, or text in the days and weeks to come. Ask, how are you today? Is there anything you need? Even simply reaching out is proven to help reduce the risk for suicide. When someone we know is struggling to cope, we can ask, be there, keep them safe, help them connect, and follow up. These five actions can help not only prevent suicides, but also build a more connected and compassionate world. Unfortunately, on many occasions, I've dealt with folks who were dealing with suicidal thoughts. And almost universally with those cases, what I have found is that most folks don't truly want to die. They just want their lives to get better. They're feeling at the time so frustrated and desperate that they can't see a pathway by which their, their life will get better. And in that desperation, they're willing to do something tragic. Those simple steps that were provided in that video can make a huge difference, even as a lay person. You don't have to be a clinician, you don't have to be a counselor, you don't have to be a therapist. You just have to be a human being. You just have to be a person who cares. 
I know we're all busy. I know we've all got a lot going on. I know that, that many of us are, are overwhelmed ourselves. But if we can just take a minute and engage on a human level with that person and let them know that we care and listen to them. And if what they're saying is setting off alarm bells that this person may be thinking about doing something dramatic or drastic to harm themselves, at least be a bridge to connect them up with folks who can help. This 988 number, if your neighbor's house was on fire, what number would you call? 911. If there's a life or death emergency or physical danger, call 911. Safety services are coming. If you know that somebody is in trouble, they're struggling with a mental health crisis, the Department of Health and Human Services now has 988. 988 is manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week by licensed certified mental health professionals who are crisis intervention specialists, who know how to de-escalate someone who is in crisis, who knows how to connect them up with the resources that they need. And they're available around the clock so they can make a difference even for someone who has a good circle of support, there may be times when those individuals' you know, support system is at work or asleep. That may be the time when they're struggling. They can call this number, they can call, they can text, they can get online and chat. But folks, never underestimate the impact that you can have on somebody else's life. The, the way that fate may work for you on that day is that you may be the only person that person talks to. When you're in that dark space, a lot of times you may feel that, that no one else cares. And just having someone who checks in periodically can make all the difference and help them get through that dark time. Folks, I want to thank you all for your time and your attention. I want to wish you a, a great rest of the day. Be safe out there. Take care.